Hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Thank you for joining us in the Utah Historical Society for our perspective speaker series. I uh, just let you know that we are recording this session and it will be available on YouTube shortly after this presentation. Um, I am Monique Davila, the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Utah Historical Society. And today, Wednesday, September 13, 2023, we have Clint Pumphrey. Um, Clint uh, is the Manuscript Curator and Co-Unit Head at Utah State University Special Collections and Archives. He has worked at the, as a Manuscript Curator since 2011 and as a Co-Unit Head since 2022. Um, he has served on the Utah Historical Quarterly Board of Editors and the Utah State Historical Records Advisory Board and currently serves as a Conference of Intermountain Archivists, SEMA. Um, actually, I believe you are um, uh, not as the president anymore, correct? <laughs> I have my facts wrong. Um, and so Clint will be presenting uh, today his work on the Outdoor Recreation Archive. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background. In 2017, USU um, uh, Special Collections and Archives partnered with the College of Agricultural and Applied Sciences, which is Outdoor Product Design and Development program to develop a historical collection of books, catalogs, periodicals, photographs, and manuscripts. Um, documenting outdoor gear and recreation. Um, what started out with a large and a rather odd donation of 1,227 catalogs from 200 brands um, and dating from 1966 to 2017 has now reached an immense, incredible heights, um, which I'm sure has surprised Clint and, and others. Um, to date, and I do, I, I do think I have these numbers wrong. So Clint, um, you know, I know you'll correct me once you start, but today's a catalog collection contains more than 4,200 catalogs from nearly 700 brands and uh, magazines collections, um, nearly 5,000 issues across 100 titles. Um, and it includes the only complete publicly available run of specialty news uh, now known as outside business journal. Um, so, not only does it hold um, these catalogs and magazines, uh, it also houses collections from outdoor enthusiast creators and and um, inventors, such as Moss Tent Works and Prana um, and Bob Gillis. Um, I honestly uh, can say, I think we're among a local celebrity here with Clint Pumphrey. He's been featured in many different magazines and invited to summits and other uh, conferences worldwide. Um, and I know um, that Clint um, will also agree to give credit to Chase Anderson. He is the program manager for outdoor product design development who has helped Clint um, with this archive and has runs a podcast and an Instagram account that publicly uh, promotes this archive and, and its collections. So um, uh, I want to thank Clint for joining us today. Uh, just letting everyone know too, that if you have any questions uh, for Clint or about his presentation or his work, there is the Q&A box. It's located, I believe at the bottom of your screen. So please um, put in questions. And once uh, we're done, uh, we will. Um, I will go ahead and, and ask those questions um, to Clint. So again, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, Clint, um, floor is now yours. All right. Thank you, Monique. Um, well, I don't know about celebrity. I think what I'm probably most well known for is uh, being Monique's uh, supervisor as a graduate intern in Special Collections and Archives at Utah State. So um, we we miss her. And uh, uh, she was a, a great person to have in the, the depths of the pandemic when we were all trying to figure out how to work from home. So um, So let me get my screen going here. presentation. All right. So can everybody see that full screen? Does that look good? Okay, I'll assume so, hearing nothing uh, otherwise. Um, well, thank you all for uh, coming to this presentation. Um, uh, I am happy anytime I can share about uh, this project. Uh, it's It's been a real pleasure. And like I said, I don't know how famous I am, but I've met some famous people through this this process too, and that's that's it's just been really cool. I had some really neat opportunities to share my work across the state and 
um, in the country and, and even internationally. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later. Um, so the Outdoor Recreation Archive uh, is a project at Utah State University Special Collections and Archives. Um, many of you have probably been up to visit us at some point, um, but uh, you know our our like most universities, uh, Utah State has a an, an art a special collections and archives uh, division in their library, and our main mission, as many archives, is to document the history of our region uh, at at the core. And so, a lot of our collections are, um, uh, you know, have to do with local history, local businesses, local organizations, local people. Um, but this this project was a really unique opportunity to partner with uh, a a program on campus and help build a resource for their program, which has grown to be uh, much bigger than than just uh, a resource for the program. So um, I will get into all that as I go forward here. So I'm Clint Pumphrey. I'm the uh, manuscript curator. And uh, I did have an update in my title. I'm now the program chair for outreach and instruction in special collections. Um, this is during the pandemic. I was looking a little rougher, but um, this is my colleague Chase Anderson, who uh, who Monique alluded to earlier. Um, Chase is the uh, program coordinator for the outdoor product design and development department, which is the program on campus that we have been partnering with on this project. So I'll be mentioning him a lot. So you, just to kind of know who who he is. So this is uh, the uh, front doors of our special collections and archives. And as I mentioned, the, the Outdoor Recreation Archive is a project that's kind of under the greater umbrella of special collections and archives. Um, it is, it, it the, the Outdoor Recreation Archive uh, just represents a very small portion of the total collections that we have at Utah State. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, 550 processed manuscript collections um, 650 or so processed photograph collections, um, you know, 40,000 books, um, and a, a university archive that documents the university's history. This collection is, um, you know, it consists of a, a catalog collection, um, a magazine collection, or a periodicals collection, and then sort of a, a documents, uh, manuscripts collection, so more primary source documents. Um, and and it's it's uh, you know as Monique says probably altogether it's probably about you know twelve or thirteen thousand um, volumes of uh, or issues of catalogs and magazines and only about fifteen um, uh, manuscript collections at this point. But you know as I'll talk about here, it's actually um, because of the sort of uh, national focus of the collection. It's really brought a, a lot of people from all over the country uh, to come visit the archive or reach out and and uh, ask for research help. Um, and so it's it's in that way, it's really, uh, uh, you know, carry, more than carried its weight uh, in terms of like the, the percentage of our total collections here at Utah State. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the scope of the the Outdoor Recreation Archive, and um, so it's it's called the Outdoor Recreation Archive, and part of that was because although it it is really intended to document the history of the outdoor industry, um, you know, part of the reason we call it the Outdoor Recreation Archive is it's something I think people can uh, relate to and understand a little more easily. Um, if we called it the Outdoor Industry Recreation or Outdoor Recreation Industry Archive or something, um, it might be a little bit more confusing. So we just kind of came up with this this short title, but it's really focused on um, documenting the brands, the the gear, the clothing um, in the outdoor industry. And the reason that we took this project on is because Utah State has this outdoor product design and development program, which is one of two under uh, two programs of its kind in the country. And it's geared towards, uh, it's a four year undergraduate program that's geared towards teaching students how to design and develop outdoor gear and clothing. So it's a pretty, um, it's it, there aren't many programs like it in the country. And so um, the initial idea behind it was 
to uh, support that program. Let's bring in some historical gear catalogs that students can use for inspiration that they can um, they can use in their uh, his. They all have to take a history of outdoor product history of outdoor products class, and so you know they could use it for that assignment. And I have to be honest, when the the idea when the the professor from that program came to us and suggested maybe we build this collection, I was a little bit skeptical. Um, for those, if anyone here is in archives or um, they work much in archives, um, catalogs are not, they're, they're pretty ephemeral and are not typically the kinds of things that constitute a permanent record um, in an archive. And so uh, it's they're just not the kind of things we typically collect. Um, one of my like go-to jokes is like that it's like I'm collecting people, uh, collecting people's junk mail, right? So it's um, it's not things that I think uh, you normally think of as as being a part of an archive. Um, so we brought uh, we brought in initial. This was in 2017. We brought in an initial donation of um, 1,200 catalogs from a group of uh, uh, three guys who just had a you know they were involved in in uh, brands early on. And um, they just had collected catalogs. One of them, Gordon Wing, um, a lot of his name is on a lot of them. It's kind of like he just saved every catalog he'd ever gotten going back to the 1960s. So uh, we bring in this collection, and um, it has it has become uh, you know a, a large part of my work here in in, in special collections, and um, has given it like I said, it's given us a lot of other other opportunities, which I'll get into. Um, so. In terms of the scope, like I mentioned, we're really talking mainly about outdoor, the history of the outdoor industry, um, not sort of recreation more broadly. Um, but of course, there are intersections there. Um, usually people who are involved in the outdoor industry are also climbers or mountain bikers or, you know, people who like to camp. And so there's a lot of, there is a lot of crossover and you'll see that in some of the examples that I'll show. But I think the other question that we've been wrestling a lot with is how do you define the outdoor industry? Um, I think if you took the broadest, you know, the broadest approach, uh, you know, you might even, obviously you're going to collect camping and hiking and, and, and climbing and some of those kind of things. But I mean, does, does the outdoor industry include um, fishing and hunting? Does it include um I don't know, you know, team sports like tennis or basketball or something like that. So we had to make sure that we we define the scope and that we were uh, making sure that we, uh, you know, didn't get uh, uh, overwhelmed quickly. And so what we've kind of settled on, I think, to this point with uh, our archive scope is, you know, camping, um, backpacking, hiking, climbing. Um, we're doing some skiing, snowboarding cross-country skiing, you know, those kind of winter sports, um, uh, mount, you know, mountaineering, uh, water, some water sports, so canoeing and kayaking. Um, and I think that uh, given the right opportunity, we're, we may be looking to get into mountain biking and uh, fly fishing, um, but we really hesitated to really move um, beyond into kind of road cycling or road running or um, uh, uh, hunting and some of those kind of things. And so um, it's, uh, that, that was kind of, that's, that's always kind of been a struggle to, to kind of define what the scope of this project is. And part of that is because like no one is really collecting this kind of material right now. I mean, a lot of people I think are collecting things from famous mountaineers or climbers or outdoorsmen, but um, actually the focus on the industry, there aren't a lot of institutions or, you know, none that I know of that are, are, are uh, making a concerted effort to collect in this area. So it's, there's also a lot of stuff coming at us and we have to decide, and it's, as an archivist, it's really hard to say, well, we're going to save this, but we're not going to save this. And so, um, but at the end of the day, sticking to the scope is important, making sure that you are able to manage the materials that you bring in and you're able to organize those, you're able to catalog those and make those accessible. That's important. So um, that's why we try to stick to our scope uh, whenever we can.
Okay. Oops. One second. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, the, the three main parts of the archive uh, are a catalog collection, a collection of um, serials or uh, periodicals, um, and then a, um, ma a manuscript or document collections. So the ca I'll talk about the catalog collection first. This is kind of where we started um, with that initial donation of catalogs. Um, it can now consist of, the updated numbers now are 6,164 catalogs from uh, across 838 brands. Um, so that's pretty amazing that there are 838 brands um, that have, uh, that, that make outdoor products. And uh, the period that we focused on um, in this collection so far is 1900 to 2023. So um, the oldest item that we have uh, is a, a catalog from David T. Abercrombie, who went on to join with uh, Ezra Finch, Fitch to, to start Abercrombie and Fitch, which was, I think a lot of people will find surprising, was actually an outdoor outfitter when it first started. And so um, they feature prominently in some of our early collections. Here's the, uh, this is the, the title page on one of those catalogs. Um, this is our oldest item here. It's um, like I said, from the David T. Abercrombie Company. Um, it has, uh, uh, it's really interesting to see, look in these things, how um, the technology has changed over the years uh, and the materials that are used. Um, one of the things that I think is, Really interesting about, um, uh, or one of the kind of interesting things that that uh, we don't see much anymore is this idea of a tump line, T-U-M-P, um, which is basically a strap on a backpack that goes over your head. Sounds very uncomfortable to me, but it was very common in the early 1900s to have that, uh, instead of a hip belt, to have the the belt over the head. So you, that's in the front cover of this, uh, this catalog. So um, just a few pages, you can see um, this is the tent section of the um, of the catalog. Um, you can get a um, looks like you can get a tent, uh, a pretty a, a pretty large tent for forty dollars. Uh, that's pretty good. So the prices have definitely changed too. Um, you know, tents made of materials we don't think of now, like waterproof silk, which is probably a silk that they've treated with some kind of wax or some kind of chemical coating. And some, you know, uh, forms that are somewhat familiar uh, to us today. The A-frame tent has been around for a long time. Was probably the first form of of kind of backpacking tent that was made. Um, these were really popular in um, the military during World War, uh, uh, dating back to the Civil War, really, but certainly in World War One and, and into World War Two. And then just a couple more pages. And so, like I mentioned, the, the collection actually goes all the way to the present. I take catalogs out of my own mailbox and put them in the collection. Um, but, uh, you know, there's sort of this, this the early 1900s, which is kind of more geared toward hunting and fishing and um, that kind of outdoor activity. But as you get into the mid um, uh, 20 or the mid uh, 20th century, um, you start to get a lot of brands that you're more familiar with. North Face was founded in 1965. Um, uh, Patagonia wasn't founded until uh, the 1980s, but um, some of the uh, other companies that were associated with back, uh, Patagonia that became Patagonia date back into the 1970s. And so these are the companies that we know today. Uh, and so those are very well represented to kind of this modern period. So this is a, the first Patagonia catalog, fall 1982. And uh, some of you may remember uh, have some of this, uh, having some of this clothing. Um, but, uh, you know, just an old catalog, this, this pile cardigan right here, um, is collectible. It's the first, uh, fleece. Um, uh, it was, a, an innovation that, uh, Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia made, uh, was this idea of the fleece. And so, um, these pile cardigans, I've, I mean, I've seen them on eBay for like 700 bucks, um, but, uh, the story is that he, uh, was like, he was looking for, uh, new materials and he, uh, like was just at a store and he saw a toilet seat cover that had this kind of fleece 
like material and he grabbed it and took it to his supplier and said, I want a, I want a material like this. And they made a, 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 a fleece out of it. And I guess kind of the rest is history. So think about that next time you are wearing your fleece. It started from a toilet seat cover. At least that's the legend. A um, couple of other uh, pages in the catalog. Okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the, the cereals collection or the periodicals collection. Um, we, uh, this is another one that can get really out of hand without sort of really focusing on scope. Um, but the, the issue here is that, uh, the, a lot of, uh, I mean, we could just focus on periodicals that are specific to the outdoor industry. The one that you see here in this photo, specialty news is the outdoor industry's trade publication. Um, that started in the 1980s. Uh, it now is called Outside Business Journal. It was bought by the company that owns Outside Magazine. Um, but it just basically keeps people in the industry updated on what are the new things that are coming out, what are the you know major issues in the industry, what's you know just what is the news that's going on in the industry. So we could have just focused on those, but the problem is that um, you're you're uh, more recreation oriented magazines also have a lot of information about gear because it again our focus is on on outdoor gear and so um so you know backpacker magazine for example they have advertisements from a lot of brand different brands that go you know going back to their beginning in the early 1970s they do they always have for many years have had a gear guide where they do gear reviews and so um you know we found ourselves really also collecting in some of these, um, uh, you know, more popular consumer oriented, uh, publications as well. Um, and you know, some of them like outside magazine, backpacker magazine, these are really, these are very widely available, but, um, um, you know, it, when libraries start to face space issues, they tend to throw away publications that are widely available, um, first. Um, sometimes, uh, back issues of even popular publications are only available, um, through a subscription, either through the, the publication or through a library that, you know, if you're, if you're not a, like a student or faculty at Utah State, you couldn't access the, the back issues of that, the database that has the back issues of that magazine. So we also feel like even though, even magazines that are, um, pretty widely circulated are important to have so that if people are coming here to study the outdoor industry, they can also, um, it can be a one-stop shop for access to those publications as well. Currently, we have um, 6,544 issues across 189 titles. Um, that is, if you think about 100, uh, complete runs of 189 titles, that would be way more than 6,544. So obviously, we have a lot of gaps, and that's still very much a work in progress. Uh, our periodical collection dates... Um, from 1929 to uh, 2023 uh, at this point. All right, so then lastly, I wanna talk about the, um, the manuscript and photograph collections uh, that, that we have in the Outdoor Recreation Archive. Um, like I said, they're about 15, maybe 15 to 20 at this point. Um, and uh, they document, uh, the, and they've come from you know, people who founded companies, people who worked for companies early on, um, you know, people who are just like, uh, inter you know, they just have an interest in the history of outdoor gear and they've collected uh, emails or self-published books or something. So they kind of come from a, a broad range of people. And so I'm going to give you some examples. So because, you know, this is uh, Utah and, and, and Utah, uh, Utah State uh, uh Utah Historical Society uh, event, I wanted to make sure to touch on the ones that uh, have Utah connections um, first. So one of those, the, the collections that we have is from a man named John Middendorf, um, who, uh, he, he actually lives in Tasmania, <laughs> but his, um, he did a lot of climbing in Zion and Zion National Park and is uh, uh, he's credited for inventing the portal edge, which is that 
uh, bed that you, you've seen pictures of like it's bolted into the side of a cliff like a thousand feet above the ground and people are you know sleep in it overnight when they're climbing really big uh, rock walls um, he's credited with inventing that and so um, he's a climber but he's also a, a, an industry uh, he also started a brand called a5 adventures i believe which is the the, the brand um, so we have his collection um, uh, of materials from uh, his Zion climbing. And so here's some examples of some of those things. Um, this is his folder. He kind of has it divided up on the different areas of Zion. So this is his folder on the Great White Throne. Um, and it's a lot of, doc a lot of you know, I think if you don't do a lot of climbing and um, or especially big wall climbing, um, what I've found is there's a lot of preparation that goes into these climbs that they really study the routes and they map them out ahead of time. And, um, and so this is kind of his planning documentation. And so you can see he has some of the routes kind of drawn out on this paper and there's, there's other things like that as well. This is his binder for, um, angels landing. Um, and so you can see some of the routes that he's marked uh, on this and the binder is just full of, of those kind of notes and information. It's kind of hard to see on the photo, but he's actually drawn some of the routes on the, the side of the rock, the rock face there. So that's one kind of Utah connection that this collection has. One that some of you may know, a person that you may, you may know is uh, Jeff Lowe, who is from Utah. He is from Ogden. And uh, he, the reason that we have his papers is because he, in addition to being a um, world-class um, alpinist and uh, climber, he uh, also started two companies, Cloudwalker and Laytalk. Um, and he co-founded Low Alpine with his brother, Greg. And so um, we have some papers that document that, um, but uh, he was involved in a lot of other things uh, in Utah. Uh, to promote climbing in Utah. And so just to give you, show you some of those things, um, he designed this holographic ice tower, which is a, uh, uh, Jeff Lowe is known for popularizing ice climbing in the U.S. And um, he built this like artificial ice climbing tower for the X Games in, the, in like 1999, I think. And um, he was really pushing the uh, city of Ogden to uh, create a permanent place for the, for the tower. And uh, I believe it was in 2007, 2008. And so he has some renderings of what that would look like, some plans for how they would reassemble the, the ice tower. Um, I don't think that maybe somebody knows, but um, I don't think it was ever actually, the plan ever actually came to, to fruition. Can you, um, but uh, I think it was going to be, basically downtown um, near the municipal building. So um, I, don't, I don't think it ever it ever came to fruition, but it, there's a whole bunch of documents about this ice climbing tower. It's kind of an interesting part of, of Ogden history. He also um, was instrumental in bringing the first international climbing competition to Utah. And uh, so it was 1988, the International Sport Climbing Championship at Snowbird. Um, Sport climbing is like where you already have bolts in the rock. So you're not bringing your own, you know, cams and nuts to, to, for, you know, protection as you go, uh, as you climb up, there's already bolts that you clip carabiners into as you go up to, to keep you from falling too far if, if you were to fall. So, um, so he was instrumental in bringing this sport climbing, international sport climbing championship, like I said, the first international climbing competition held in the United States. And so we have a lot of records from that uh, event. And so here's a kind of a promotional poster for it. And then um, sort of a, this hand this kind of, is kind of interesting. This is the, a diagram of the wall. And so he's got all the climbs or all the holds for the wall all drawn out. And there's all these notes about their positioning and different things. And so, um, so kind of a, another neat part of Utah history that's documented in, in this archive. Um, but like I said, the, the collection is, is national in focus. So um, it does go beyond um, just the, the industry in Utah. Um, a good example of that is the Moss Tent Works collection. 
which is uh, Moss Tent Works started in 19, the 1970s in uh, Camden, Maine. So uh, pretty far from Utah, uh, but it was started by a man named Bill Moss, who was a, a fabric artist. Well, he was an artist and he, he, um, he had an interest in fabrics. He started out as an illustrator at the Ford Times, uh, which is the Ford Motor Company's publication. And uh, then he decided to start his own tent company. And so we had, this is a really great collection because it's, it's very complete. It has all of the legal records, the marketing records, the, you know, financial records, the design records for the tent. So it's, it's kind of a, a complete collection from, uh, uh, of, of an entire company. That, that's kind of, uh, that's one of the, the interesting things about it. So here's just some of the photographs and documents from the collection. Um, you can see the thing about moss tents is they were really beautiful. Um, I mean, to, you know, there's, you kind of know your standard tent designs, the tunnel tent, a uh, dome tent, um, but he would build these really uh, beautiful uh, uh, structures uh, that were kind of pieces of art in their own right. So this is one of his sketchbooks. This is uh, uh, some sketches he did for a, um, uh, a tent. He was commissioned by the Ford Motor Company to build a tent for the back of the Ford Pinto. So that was one of his, he had a really, he had a, a big interest in the interface between tents and automobiles, which is kind of interesting given today's, you know, rooftop tent, uh, the interest in rooftop tents and things like that. He actually has some mock-ups of rooftop tents, I think, uh, from the 1950s. So the idea has been around for a while. This is the letter from Ford that was um, uh, commissioning him on that, uh, uh, on that, that, that tent for the Pinto. Um, this is a patent for the pop tent, which is um, uh, thought to be the first dome tent. Um, which is a design, of course, that's ubiquitous today. But um, at the time, it was very, uh, it, was, it was a new idea. A lot of the tents were that A-frame shape. Um, it was said that this tent was, um, you know, easy to open. Uh, it popped open just like an umbrella. Uh, I had the opportunity to set up a pop tent uh, last year, and it is not as easy to open as an umbrella. <laughs> so, but still kind of an interesting design. There's like a little locking mechanism on the top and you kind of push it down and lock it. It's, it's kind of interesting. This is called the para wing. It was just a simple shelter that he invented um, for things like this, for picnics and things like that. And this is a watercolor he did of a bicycle tent, which is just kind of a, an, an interesting, just a, a really beautiful painting. And some more sketches. All right, so I talked a little bit about um, special collections earlier in our collections. Um, uh, for those of you who who haven't been and and haven't been back in our stacks, um, you know we uh, have a dedicated um, facility for archives. Um, so all of these documents are kept in our our closed secure area uh, at about sixty five degrees, thirty five percent humidity. Um, all of our shelving is in this compact style, so we can store more, um, uh, more document or more things on us in the footprint that we have. Um, but you know, the thing, like I said earlier, the outdoor archive is a very small part. It probably would only fill about uh, three of the shelves that you see uh, you see here. Okay. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about how we've promoted the the archive um, and uh, and kind of this the like kind of how this project has taken off. Um, so I I think what started the, or what caused this project to take off in the first place was our um, my colleague Chase had a really good idea to start an Instagram account where he posted a new cover image every day. And he's kind of moved on to posting more content from the insides of the catalogs too. Um, but we really quickly got to 10,000 followers and 20,000. And um, I think as of now, we're a little over 24,000. 
Um, if you want to follow us, we're Outdoor Rec Archive, and uh, you can scan that QR code to take to take you straight to the straight to our page. Um, but uh, we started realizing, I think, from kind of how that as that following is growing, that this uh, people all over the country, all over the world, were um, uh, really hungry for this type of content. And uh, so, if you look at the metrics for our Instagram account, um, really only about half of our followers are from the U.S. Um, there are a lot of people in uh, our, the the uh, there are a lot of people in the UK uh, who follow the account, a lot of people in Japan who follow the account. And so um, it's uh, it's really kind of gotten an international following in that way. Um, just one interesting thing. Uh, it makes us the third largest Instagram account at Utah State <laughs> um, behind the general USU uh, account and the the football uh, team were even bigger than the basketball team's Instagram. Which, if you know anything about Aggie basketball, that's um, that's saying something. So, um, so uh, uh, we're we're hoping to you know football. If you know football has a bad year, maybe we'll catch them. I don't know. Um, we've also had a lot of opportunity to share this project through the media. Um, so this is one of the articles that that Outside Business Journal, the trade publication for the the industry, um, published about our collection. Um, but we've also done um, interviews with local media. We've done um, we actually get quite a few interviews with fashion publications. Um, I, I yeah I uh, uh, the one that is kind of most amazing to me is a. Uh, uh, publication online publication called Hype Beast, uh, which is a men's fashion publication. They have 3.5 million Instagram followers. Um, they uh, uh, instead of like they they published an article about us um, and about our collection, and um, instead of likes, they have hypes. So we got like 7,700 hypes, and so I'm asking you know around like can I. Um, how do you how do you uh, quantify how do how do hypes fit into like you know your your uh, uh, annual reports for your you know your your archives and and your promotion packets for for you know faculty um, haven't figured that one out yet but um, it's just kind of neat I, I think um, that's an area we uh, have been surprised is the the number of kind of fashion. Uh, people in the fashion world that have have really latched onto this project, and um, I think that just really has to do with um, kind of this uh, moment we're in right now, where vintage is uh, vintage inspired designs are really um, really popular. So, um, yeah, fashion publications. Um, we've also been featured in some um, live, uh, you know, national library and archives public uh, blogs and publications, and so you know, trying to get, you know, make sure that we promote our work in that world as well. But I think we've done 20, 21, 22 interviews. And I think um, I had an interview that was translated into French and one that was translated into Japanese. So um, kind of, kind of amazing. Um, another great opportunity that we've had is to, um, uh, to build exhibits using some of the materials in our collection. And um, this opportunity came through a trade show in Portland called the Functional Fabric Fair. Um, the program, the Outdoor Product Design and Development Program, already had been working with the trade show to bring professors and students there to do presentations. Um, and so when they found out about the arcade, they were really interested in having us do an exhibit because they're always looking at ways to do something different than just having booths and presentations and things. So um, this is a trade show that where the booths are people who make fabric and snaps and zippers and buttons and all that kind of stuff. And it's attended by the brands that make the clothing. And so, um, you know, I think there's, uh, you know, depending on the show, there's two to 4,000 people who attend. We usually have a pretty like nice location down one of the main walkways. This is a, um, an exhibit we did in Portland at the Functional Fabric Fair in, uh, I think it was last 
last year, yeah, 2022. Um, the Functional Fabric Fair has a, uh, uh, a kind of a partner show in Munich, Germany called Performance Days. And um, so we had this really great opportunity to do an exhibit uh, last fall at uh, Performance Days in Munich. Same thing, same kind of show, but just in Europe instead of um, uh, instead of the U.S. So, um, and thankfully those invites have continued. So I'm actually going to be headed to Munich at, on October 1st and um, uh, to to check out uh, or to install another exhibit. Um, the exhibit we're installing is the history of waterproofing and membranes. So like membranes are like Gore-Tex and Pertex and those kind of waterproof membranes. And then this is another collection we did on the history of tents at um, Functional Fabric Fair in Portland. We're also offering a research fellowship um, because there's so much interest um, kind of outside of Utah. And, um, you know, we want to try to provide some <clears throat> travel funds for people who might not be able to make it otherwise. And so, so far we've offered um, these fellowships for two years. We offer two each year. We've had um, a graduate student uh, from the University of Nebraska who um, was building a, a art installation, um, uh, two professors, uh, two art professors, one from Tennessee Chattanooga and one from, I think, Florida State um, who came out and um, uh, uh, they're also working on, uh, they, they uh, basically, they like to, to build tents and and present them in interesting ways. So they did one one time. First kind of one they did was uh, they made it out of completely clear like material. And uh, but then after visiting our archive, they screen printed a lot of the vintage imagery onto fabric and then made a tent out of that. And um, that tent was displayed uh, has been displayed uh, around the state. I think it was. I think um, they've got an installation down in Salt Lake right now at the Leonardo, but. I'm not 100% sure on that if it's still there. Um, so that's kind of been an interesting opportunity to work with artists. Um, but we've also had a um, professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, who specializes in the history of the outdoor industry. Um, and then our last, um, this past year, we also had Avery Truffleman, who was a longtime producer on the 99% Invisible podcast and has since started her own podcast called Articles of Interest. And she's doing, um, she's going to be doing, a, I believe she's she's thinking about a five-part series on the history of outdoor clothing uh, and this idea of gork core, um, which is like, you know, outdoor fashion. Um, and she's already been kind of pitching this on 99% Invisible. And so that's probably going to come out next year sometime. Um, so she came and stuck a big microphone in my face. I got really nervous. And um uh, but she was able to look through a lot of a lot of things. And so we're looking forward to that, uh, seeing what comes out of that. Another thing we do every year is the, uh, or we'll, uh, what we've done for the last two years is uh, what we call the Outdoor History Summit. It brings together people from all over the industry who have an interest in the history of outdoor gear. And so um, our next one is actually coming up. It's, on, it's virtual. Uh, so um, on November 8th, from nine o'clock to 1230. Um, it's free. So if you wanna register the QR code there, um, you can you can register for free. And uh, I think it's gonna be a really exciting lineup. Um, we have um, a designer from Nike ACG, which is the Nike's uh, outdoor, um, kind of outdoor line, uh, who's gonna be talking about how they use archives in their design process. Um, we have an archivist from REI. Um, what else do we have? Our two fellowship um, recipients are gonna be presenting about their work. So um, the artist from Tennessee and Florida, and then Avery Truffleman will be presenting about her her up, her upcoming work uh, on the podcast. Um, and I feel like I'm leaving someone else out. The, the schedule is there. Uh, and so you can uh, check that out uh, if you're interested in, in attending. 
Um, I also do a lot of research consults. Um, you know, I had mentioned that even though this collection is relatively small, there's uh, I get it gets a lot of attention. Um, I I measured it uh, uh, over the last year. Um, Twenty percent of my research consults, people emailing me from, you know, asking questions, uh, were actually from for the outdoor rec archive material, and so you know, given that it only takes up three of those shelves and you know a collection that's ten times, uh, you know, twenty times bigger, um, is it's it's definitely um, you know more than pulling its weight. We've also had companies that have come to visit us. They've sent uh, design teams to come do re uh, research in the archives. So this is um, Allbirds uh, design team, the shoe company. Um, but we've also had um, Under Armour, um, Danner, uh, MSR has been here too. Um, so that, those have been some really interesting opportunities. And then of course, at the end of the day, this was this was originally about the students and making sure that the students had were grounded in the history of the outdoor industry, and so uh, we always make sure to promote the collection with our students, um, and and you know try to get them in the doors. Uh, they all of the students in the program have an account. They use the archive for their history of outdoor products class, um, and. Uh, uh, there are other classes that come in as well. Um, there's a, I had a hosted a color theory class last spring where they came in and looked at, you know, historical color palettes. And so um, always trying to get the students uh, involved in using the archive. Um, we also recently um, hired a, a, a student intern just for the outdoor recreation archive. And so he's doing a lot of the, the cataloging work and Promote, you know, helping with some of the promotion and things like that. So really trying to get the students in there. So just to wrap up um, kind of the future of this project, um, you know, if you've got something that's people want, you, you should keep keep working on it. So that's what we plan to do. Um, we're, we've got a lot of donors that we're working with right now and trying to bring in uh, more, more collections um, related to this topic. Um, and so uh, I think it will continue to grow. Um, some of the other projects we're working on is we're um, looking at the, because we've had so much interest from artists in the, the research fellowship, we're looking at partnering with a, a company to uh, host a, an artist residency on campus that uses the archive. Um, so that's another idea that's, that's coming up. And then, you know, I think ultimately at least Chase and I believe that this project is could be big enough that it would need its own dedicated staff. And I think our kind of pie in the sky dream is that we could, you know, find a brand or a, a, a company founder who's um, really passionate about the history of the outdoors, who would be willing to fund, you know, a program around this, this archive. And um, so, you know, if you, if you have, uh, if you just sold an outdoor company and you have a couple billion dollars, let me know and talk. Um, and uh, but I think that's, you know, ultimately where we hope this could go one day. Who knows? Um, who knows? But um, in the meantime, we'll continue to do our work and uh, and and try to preserve the history of the industry as best we can. So that's uh, what I have. Um, if you want to know more about the archive and more about what's in it, um, including some uh, an inventory of our catalog and magazine collections and finding aids for our document collections, uh, you can go to this website or scan this QR code here, um, and that'll take you to a web page that will explain everything about the archive and 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 what's in it. So, um, so with that, I think I'm about out of time. So. Um, uh, Monique, what, should we do questions? Yes, thank you, Clint. Um, I've seen you present this before, and I always love hearing about it. Maybe it's also because I help work on this um, collection, and it's just, it's so cool to see this collection, um, you know, go from, I think, started 2020, just that time, how much is expanded, 
and it is just fun and exciting to see, you know, where it's going and what you're all doing. Um, it's amazing. So hopefully someone in the audience or in your future has a few billion dollars to lend you or not lend you, but help you, <laughs> you know, make this bigger and, um, and better. So thank you, uh, Clint. So right now I'll, um, if you have any questions, um, please use the Q and A box at the bottom and, um, ask but we do have a couple so far so Clint uh one of the first questions is did you face any copyright issues when digitizing yeah that's a good question um so we uh so when we digitize we digitize for two reasons one is we every time um we get a new catalog we digitize the cover to put on a on a our digital exhibit uh website to Built, create sort of a visual catalog for the the collection. Visual catalog of the catalog collection. A little confusing, um, but you know we, um, you know we think it's we only put the cover up. We don't put the entire issue up, and so I think um, we feel pretty good about that. Um, we also will provide full scans of catalogs for um, personal research copies, which is a pretty common um, thing for archives to do. And they do sign a, a form that says they won't post it online or use it for any other reason than their own personal um, research. And so um, we we do try to respect the company's rights uh, to these materials because at the end of the day, we rely on them for a lot of our material donations. And so we want to have good relationships there. Um, we're also, I, I didn't mention this, but we um, are publishing a book uh, that will be coming out sometime next year basically a, a coffee table book of imagery from uh, a cover imagery from the catalog collection. Um, and this is through a publisher, Hudson and Tim, or Thames and Hudson in the UK. Um, and uh, we have made, we, we were very specific. Um, we were very firm with the publisher that we wanted companies to give us um explicit permission to use the images for that book. And so we have been reaching out uh, to each company that we're using. I think, um, I can't remember how many companies it is, but it's probably 50 or 60 um, to make sure they're okay with us using the book. Because again, like I said, we want to make sure we, we're trying to be a service to the industry as well. And we want to make sure we have good relationship. Uh, great. So we have another question. Is there anything in particular that you would love to collect but haven't come across yet? Uh, well, um, actually, this is a good uh, forum for this. Um, we've um, we haven't had great luck cracking into um, uh, materials related to the history of Utah's outdoor industry. And, um, you know, we, a lot, some of that is because the companies that were founded here, uh, have been bought and, um, the records have just kind of gotten lost over the years or, um, in the case of like black diamond, you know, they have their own, um, people who manage their, their archives, which is great. Like we're here to support that too. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, even though we are trying to document this industry nationally, I think we want, we would love to have really robust collections documenting the industry in Utah. Um, and uh, so I think, I think that would be one thing I would really, uh, really like to see uh, the collection grow. We've actually had requests from <clears throat> people in the state to do a traveling exhibit about the history of the industry in Utah. And I would love to do that, but right now we just don't have the materials to support it. So I think that's one direction we could definitely strengthen. Um, another question from Rachel, um, considering the user base for the archive is national and international, is any of the archive digitized and available in digital collections? Um, yeah, uh, well, I think part of it is, uh, it it is just the cover images for the catalogs are available <clears throat> at this point. Um, um, part of it is that some of those copyright issues, uh, I think people, that's what people want. We always hear people say, can, like, do you have these digitized, these catalogs digitized and online? That's certainly what they want. 
<clears throat> but it also has to do with capacity. Um, <clears throat> those of you who are involved with digitization and libraries and archives, it's a very time intensive process. And um, <clears throat> so it's kind of all we can do just to keep up with uh, our cover scans uh, a lot and our scans for our, uh, our patrons. So um, um, I think I, I certainly would love to see some of these materials, like in the, the stuff that we do own, like <clears throat> the manuscript collections where that those rights have been signed over, or we could put more of that online. But um, right now we're just so focused on building it and making it accessible at a basic level um, that I think that's something we'll hopefully can focus more on down the road. Yeah, I think from my own experience as someone who um, scanned many of these front uh, catalog covers, you're right to say that's capacity and time and students and, and so on. So I'm sure once you get more help from that, you'll be able to upload uh, the insides of these as well. Um, the next question is, um, just curious, or for clarification, this collection is just 2D items, or do you have 3D items as well? And if the former, where do you get the artifacts for the exhibits at the trade shows? Yeah, great question. Um, so I should have mentioned this when I talked about scope. Um, we have been pretty firm that we don't take uh, artifacts and gear. And um, that's not because it hasn't been offered to us, or we don't think it's important. It just comes down to a space issue and um, a staff issue, you know, taking care of artifacts is a completely different profession. And so, um, you know, we don't have the kind of people who know how to take care of fabric and, um, and, and, uh, you know, box that, that kind of material for long-term storage. So um, we, we haven't really gotten into that. For the trade shows, um, the trade shows have been very generous in, uh, I send them a list of things on eBay that I want to display and they buy them. And, and if they can't, if we can't find what we need on eBay, they have a network of people who uh, in the industry who they can um, ask for, for, uh, uh, or for items to exhibit. And so that's kind of how we've got, we've gotten those materials or those artifacts. I know that you also have, um, goodness, what are they called? Like pattern making and clothing. Um, so I guess that could be considered objects somehow, but mm -hmm. I know it's small. Yeah, that's a good point. We do have, so there was a, there was a, um, uh, I don't know what would you call it, like a, uh, a fad, a trend in the 1970s, um, kind of late 60s into the 70s, early 80s of, um, sewing your own outdoor clothing. And so there were um, several companies that popped up. Uh, Frostline Kits is probably the most, um, probably the biggest of these, but basically they would send you all the fabric and snaps and down or, you know, polyester filling or whatever you need, zippers you needed to build a parka and they would send you the instructions on how to sew it together. And, um, and you would do that. And so because our program is focused on, you know, making um, outdoor clothing, like actually sewing it and, and designing it, um, we thought this would be a fairly easy way of um, uh, to kind of help support, uh, support that and show a really interesting part of the uh, gear history. And so we do have some uh, of those kits, but they're not assembled. They're, they're just yeah, they're just still in their original packaging. <laughs> um, so a follow up to that question, Michelle asks, what happens to the purchase materials after the trade shows? Um, typically the trade show keeps them. Um, and uh, we've been able to reuse some of the items for later shows. Uh, although one of the, I don't know if you, if you remember in that slide with the tent exhibit, there was a big yellow geodesic tent um, they actually gave that to the outdoor product design and development program as sort of like a little study cubicle um, in their space. So uh, mostly they keep it. I do have to just promote also uh, Utah Historical Society. Um, if you have any artifacts that you cannot take, uh, we would accept them. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Um, I know we're out of time, but I do have one question. I'm curious. So 
Um, I know that a lot of researchers you mentioned have have utilized this collection, like for instance, someone in the um doing an art installation in Nebraska and uh the history of outdoor clothing. But um how have other researchers used this collection and like what are they researching or what are they hoping to find in this collection? Yeah. Um it's it it really uh runs the gamut. I mean, um, you know, we do have academic historians who archives have always um, catered to and, and, you know, it's kind of our bread and butter. Um, but the neat thing about this collection, I think, is the the other, the other kinds of people who have, who the archive has brought in, um, who might not otherwise use, use an archive. Um, it's a lot of people in the fashion industry. So um, fashion designers uh, who are looking for inspiration for, um, for clothing. Um, we actually had a um a designer at well I can't I can't like mention it I can't say the specific name because we you know who uses our archives is confidential but it was a major international like sportswear brand um they were designing a, a line of clothing for their one of their uh <clears throat> entertainment uh clients so he's a famous um hip hop artist actually and so they were, they contacted us to like, cause they needed, um, they wanted, uh, inspiration for like closures. So zippers and snaps and hook, you know, a different kind of ways of like clasps and different things on, on vintage clothing. And so, um, so that's kind of a cool opportunity, but also like marketing people that are trying to get that vintage look for their marketing materials. Um, there are people who are just like outdoor gear enthusiasts there's a guy who reached out about he has a a museum a, like an online museum of climbing equipment and so he just needed some images to like bear like he could compare his equipment and verify what he had um uh yeah there are people who are relaunching brands so a lot of you know 868 brands or whatever a lot of those brands have gone out of business and so um, right now, it seems like it's a pretty common for people to relaunch defunct brands. So when they do that, they don't have any of that brand's archive. And so they come to us and to get copies of the catalog so they can use that material and, you know, in their marketing. So um, a lot of different uses. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Clint, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for coming to our Perspective Speaker Series. Um, I did drop some things in the chat, the Instagram account, the digital exhibit, and I know Clint has um, the link up to the uh, library guide and his email there if you need um, any, have any questions or so on. But um, again, thank you all uh, for, for joining us today. Um, and everyone have a good day. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for coming.